A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to The Sidebar, presented by True Crime News, taking you inside the courtrooms of high-profile and notorious cases from across the country. I'm your host, Joshua Ritter. I'm a criminal defense lawyer based in Los Angeles and previously an L.A. County prosecutor for nearly a decade. You can find me on all social media at Joshua Ritter ESQ or at JoshuaRitter.com. We are recording this on Wednesday, September 25th, 2024. On this week's show, the accused shooter of a rising rap star revealing the shockingly low sum he received in exchange for taking the man's life. Plus, a jealous man accused of running down a romantic rival with his truck. But first, emotional courtroom outbursts from a defendant accused of stabbing his girlfriend over 55 times. I am flying solo today, folks, so bear with me, hop on board, and let's jump right into these cases. First, out of Hamilton, Ohio, a man accused of stabbing his girlfriend to death has come undone during early court proceedings with displays of emotion that could be detrimental to his defense. Toby Madden allegedly stabbed his living girlfriend, Rochelle Bruchaw, 55 times in the couple's home, ending the pair's 27-year-long relationship. While Madden has maintained his innocence, he broke down upon seeing his daughter in the courtroom, tearfully apologizing for the murder of her mother. The outburst wouldn't be the last emotionally charged reaction from Madden as the man began uncontrollably sobbing again during a detective's testimony in which photos of Bruchaw's body were shown. Though the impact of the outburst remains to be seen, it's going to be an uphill battle for Madden, with trial expected to continue through at least the end of this week. This was, you, you guys should really take a look at this video. It really was incredible. Um, and it was all caught on tape because there are cameras inside of the courtroom. But he turned before the jury came out, saw his daughter, saw his other family members, and apologized in open court. It, 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 the prosecutor in in something that I wasn't able to see on video, but the prosecutor even talked about how he was motioning with his hands as if he was talking about, I'm talking about the stabbing. And he's tearful and apologizing. All of this again before the jury enters the courtroom. Now, what does the prosecutor do with this? Well, first of all, this is evidence. The prosecutor prosecutor can, should, and did use this in their opening statements, which was incredible. About a half an hour later, the prosecutor stands up on the at the lectern in front of the jurors and begins his opening statements. And beforehand, he says, I have my opening statement here, but I have to tell you something that just took place in court here about 30 minutes ago. This man, the accused defendant, turned, saw his family members, and apologized to them for the murder that he is now accused of and what you as jurors are going to sit in judgment of him for. Incredible stuff. Just stuff that you do not see. And you may be asking the question, well, is that appropriate? That's not really testimony, is it? I mean, he's not on the stand. He hasn't taken an oath. How is the prosecutor allowed to talk about something like that? What about these all these questions of hearsay and everything else? First of all, the way that the defendant appears in court is something that jurors are allowed to uh, consider. The way that they act, the, the way that they react, the outbursts that they have in court, all of that can be considered by the uh, jurors. You know, are they responding to evidence that is is very detrimental to them and damning to them in a way that a normal person would, or are they not? That is something that, yes, jurors can take into consideration, because, and that's why we have Jury trials the way that we do with the, with jurors sitting right there watching the defendant. Um, but the other kind of more technical issue here is while this is not actual testimony, any statement made by the defendant is admissible in court by the prosecution under the hearsay exception of a party opponent. So the prosecutor, for the most part, can get in any statement made by the defendant ever and always under this exception. But that includes statements made inside of court even without the jurors present. He can 
say this is what the defendant said. Now, he's going to have to actually present evidence of that in court because he himself cannot testify to it. And the the statement that he gave during opening statements, that the judge always says, is not actually evidence. But he said, there are witnesses here in court who will testify to what was said. We have a recording because we have video cameras here in court. And we will play that for you. So this case is one of those cases where, I mean, if you want to talk about it being strong beforehand, the, the defense entirely sunk themselves uh, with this outburst at, at the very beginning. And I don't quite know how the defendant responds to this. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know really if he has it in him or his team has it in, in them. I mean, their defense before all of this was that he didn't do it. Somebody else was responsible. So I'll, I'll, good luck with all of that now that he's basically admitted to it in court. I suppose that you argue, uh, you know, crime of passion, person suffering from um, some sort of mental unrest. I mean, they even asked at one point to have him in a different part of the courtroom to watch the trial because he can't seem to control himself emotionally. The judge has not allowed that. He continues to be in court and continues to have these kind of emotional, overly emotional reactions to everything. But that is really all a part of this for the jurors to uh, be using in their assessing of the case. And it also asks the question of, you know, if this trial, if this person's basically admitting to it in court, what are we going through all of this for? And sometimes that's the point of these trials is that they are kind of just handling the business of the people that this person has not accepted a plea. You can't force him to accept a plea just because it seems like he's very willing to accept that he's responsible. You can't force that person then to then plead to something. So sometimes you're just going through the motions and that may sound like a waste of taxpayer dollars, but it really isn't. It's the, the business of the people to get this work done. Uh, we used to refer to it when I was in the DA's office as taking a long plea when you had a trial that was essentially a slam dunk and the defense wasn't going to put up much of a defense at all. It's just kind of like, let's get the work done. So that's what's happening here. It's a very fascinating. I, I've never actually seen something like that. I've dealt many times with defendants having outbursts in court, but usually they're, they're, they're somebody, a defendant calling somebody a liar, uh, not them basically admitting to the murder before the trial even gets started. We will continue to keep an eye on that case, though. Have you ever felt a sense of unease when you leave your home wondering if everything will be safe while you are away? I know I have. And after years of discussing these stories each week on True Crime News, I knew I needed to secure my home with the best. After a lot of research, I landed with Simply Safe. I've trusted Simply Safe to protect my home for a couple of years now, and the security and service have all exceeded my expectations. With fast protect monitoring and live guard protection, Simply Safe agents can act within five seconds of receiving your alarm and can even see and speak to intruders to stop them in their tracks. I really like that with Simply Safe, you never have to be locked into a long-term contract. You can cancel at any time and their pricing is transparent and affordable at less than a dollar a day. Plus, it's easy to install and activate your Simply Safe system. It takes less than an hour, or you can choose professional installation and have a pro do it for you. Protect your home with 50% off a new Simply Safe system, plus a free indoor security camera when you sign up for fast protect monitoring. Just visit simplysafe.com slash true crime. That's simplysafe.com slash true crime. There's no safe like Simply Safe. Uh, let's move on then to Memphis, Tennessee, where shocking testimony re revealed that one of the men accused in a beloved rapper's fatal shooting received a mere $800 for the hit. Young Dolph, born Adolph Thornton Jr., was gunned down outside of a bakery in his hometown of Memphis back in 2021. Nearly three years later, his alleged shooters, Cornelius Smith and Justin Johnson, are appearing in front of a court as Johnson's murder trial is underway. Smith took the stand in Johnson's trial, testifying that the hit was ordered by the brother of a rival Memphis rapper, Yo Gotti, with the gunman allegedly offered $40,000 for the execution. 
However, Smith testified to only receiving a meager $800 in the killing before he was eventually arrested. While Johnson's trial is ongoing, it is unclear if Smith will face trial or agree to a plea deal in the killing. The reason he provided uh, was that it was time. The reason he provided for his testimony was that it was time to be truthful, adding, I'm going to jail anyway. I can get it off my chest. This, again, it's it's funny. This week, we have a couple of cases where you, we're seeing things that you just don't usually see. I mean, I feel like we could say that every single week. If you're at all a person who follows uh, true crime or true crime legal news, it, it, it really is something that can kind of shock you as long as you may have been doing this. I've been doing it for decades and I've been observing for even longer, uh, but you always seem to find something that will continue to shock you. And in this case, we have a defendant who is, by all accounts, taking the witness stand to testify against his co-defendant, but also himself, implicating himself in the murder because he just kind of wants it off his chest. Let's not be confused here. He is a prosecution witness. This is not the defense case. This is not the prosecution has put on their case. Now it's the defense case. One of the defendants says decided to take the stand, not all that abnormal, and wants to rat out his co-defendant. This is during the prosecution case, a defendant has agreed to cooperate cooperate, pardon me, with the prosecution, waive his Fifth Amendment right, and say I'm responsible for this whole thing. And I have not seen or heard reported that there's any kind of immunity agreement or plea agreement that exists at this time. And it may just be that way. It may just be that he simply wants to be done with this, simply wants to take responsibility for it, perhaps offered some sort of um, cooperation to the prosecution. Prosecution likely said, no dice. We're not giving you any kind of deal. We've got this caught on video. We've got enough evidence on you to begin with. Why do we need to deal with you and have you rat on your fellow man, I shouldn't use that term rat, but have you testify against your co-defendant. Um, and he may said, I'm going to do it anyways. And so therefore, it's even better for the prosecution because now there's not that question on cross-examination. Well, aren't you in fact receiving some sort of huge benefit? Aren't you receiving some sort of immunity or some sort of plea deal to testify here? Now on cross, the only thing they can go after him for is well, you know, you didn't really say this before. Didn't you say that you weren't implicated in the murder at a previous time? I mean, how weak is that? The cross-examination is essentially trying to get him to admit that he didn't commit the murder. Or if you did commit it, my client wasn't involved. It it really is uh, shocking stuff. And again, um, I don't know what you do if you're the other defendant. If you're Johnson's defense attorneys at these point at this point, how do you pivot? You know, like I said, usually if you have a co-defendant who's flipped and decided to testify against you, you talk about the immunity that he's enjoying. You talk about the uh, plea deal that he's getting, the promises made to him by the prosecution, and all of those things and ways that he was affected in giving his testimony. None of that exists here. I think you simply go, hey, you know, you attack his character. This is a guy who, you know, he was part of the murder, but not me. And so are you going to believe the word of a murderer or or this is a guy who's committed other crimes? You're going to believe somebody like that? Again, weak T at best if you're Johnson's defense team. So another one of those cases where it's kind of like it might be over before it's really begun and what are we doing here? Again, we're doing the people's work. We're doing the work of the people getting justice done. And sometimes it's just going through the steps to get us all there. Uh, again, another case that we will keep our eyes on, but another case uh, that I think we all know exactly where this is headed. Let's get serious. Investing can be intimidating. Sometimes it's easier to just put it off or not deal with it at all. Today's episode is sponsored by Acorns. Acorns makes it easy to start automatically saving and investing for you, your kids, and your retirement. 
You don't need a lot of money or expertise to invest with Acorns. In fact, you can get started with your spare change. Acorns recommends an expert-built portfolio that fits you and your money goals, then automatically invests your money for you. And now Acorns is putting their money into your future. Open an Acorns Later IRA and get up to a 3% match on new contributions. That's extra money for your retirement. It's important to take charge of your future, and Acorns is a great way to get started. Head to acorns.com slash true crime or download the Acorns app and start saving and investing for your future today. Paid non-client endorsement. Compensation provides incentive to positively promote Acorns. Investing involves risk. Acorns Advisors, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor. View important disclosures at acorns.com slash true crime. Finally, we move to Greenwood, South Carolina, where a man is facing trial after allegedly using his truck to kill a romantic rival. William Bud Ackerman Jr. is accused of intentionally crashing his vehicle into Kenneth McClendon, who was dating Ackerman's estranged wife at the time of the incident. Though Ackerman and his wife were only a few weeks away from finalizing their divorce, prosecutors say the man's jealousy got the better of him, leading him to ram his Ford F-250 into McClendon. The Ackerman's former nanny testified that she found McClendon's body on the ground, shirtless and with only one shoe. Jurors saw ring camera footage of the incident and heard from officers who testified to finding Ackerman and his truck at his parents' house roughly a half mile from the crash site. While Ackerman's first prosecution ended with a mistrial, the proceedings seemed on track thus far and we will update you with any developments. Just as a note, the previous attorneys, the previous trial ended because his previous attorney was taken to the hospital during opening statements and he fell in the courtroom during the first day of witness testimony. And I bring that point out because it it really is something that I think we continue and do well to continue to to remind ourselves of how much has to come together to put on a trial. And um, I've even been removed from being a prosecutor for so long that it's, it's sometimes easy for me to forget. But I remember how difficult it was to make the stars align, to get all of your witnesses together, to get everybody cooperating, to, con- to, to uh, deal with everyone's schedules. Sometimes you're flying people in from out of town. You're, you're, you're really putting on this high wire act of getting everyone there and then even things like, you know, the health of the defense attorney could be something that just derails an entire trial and you have to start all over again. So just an interesting note, I thought that, you know, sometimes we watch all of this and we almost can take for granted um, that these trials, uh, you know, just kind of made themselves and you don't realize the amount of work, planning and even luck that is involved sometimes in getting these things off the ground. But in this case, it really is going to come down to, I think, that video footage. And now apparently it's grainy. uh, It's ring camera footage. It's obviously not something that was focused on the street. It was something that was taken from, you know, the a, a, a ways back from the street. I'll say two things about this, and I and I've got a little bit of of gun shy when it comes to the strength of video cases, and I'll explain why. But first, video, if done right, can be incredibly powerful if it is used in conjunction with other things, other corroborating witnesses, other corroborating evidence. Um, That can be things like eyewitnesses, that can be things like cell phone video, Uh, or or cell phone evidence that can help connect uh, the location of people to where the crime took place. Many, many other things. Many other, you know, quote unquote, traditional non-video evidence is helpful and should be used. But merely relying upon the video, I think is a mistake for prosecutors and a mistake for a prosecutor in this case, especially when there could be built in other defenses. Um, Accident, not saying these are all that convincing, but accident, 
Uh, he was in a rage. He drove off, had no idea who he hit. Uh, self-defense, he felt he was being threatened. Again, say what you will about how convincing any of these are, but don't take for granted that somehow videotape means that there's a slam dunk in a case. And I'll tell you a reason why. Early in my career, I, I should say midway in my career as a prosecutor, I had a case where the entire crime was caught on the highest quality of surveillance video I think I have ever seen up to that point and even since then. It was really high definition video and it was from video camera that had been recently installed and it was by all serendipity a video camera that happened to capture as if it had been framed that way the crime that we were concerned with. Mm -hmm. So everything that I needed for this case, other than audio, was caught right on that videotape. And I think that gave me a false sense of security and confidence in the case. And I remember even in my naivete speaking to my fellow prosecutors, you know, we always ask each other, how's your trial? How's it going? What do you got coming up? How do you feel about your case? And this one, I would say, it's all on video. I, I'm golden. I'm good. I mean, it, to, in my view, calling the victim and calling some other people were, were just kind of window dressing for this videotape, which is, you know, I felt like I could stand up, press play, sit back down and say, you know, let me know when I need to give my closing argument. And that trial uh, ended in a hung trial. And I had to retry it again. And you can be sure the second time around, I gave a lot more um, attention to everything other than the video. I played the video, but I probably played it about a tenth of the time I played it in the original trial because I didn't want to focus so much on the video. The video was compelling and the video was still my strongest piece of evidence, but I didn't want to use it as a crutch and not make my case more solid with everything else. And I also didn't want to overplay it and somehow... Um, because the, the crime that was caught on tape was violent crime. I didn't want to take away from the shock value of it to jurors. Sometimes you play something too much, they've seen it too much, and they begin to just kind of become numb to their original reaction to something as shocking and violent as this videotape was. So that's just kind of Josh's uh, story corner for this week. Uh, and just a, a little commentary on when we see uh, video evidence in a case. But that is our show for this week. Those are the cases. Uh, I wanted to give a very special thank you to all of our listeners and viewers who stay with us each and every week. We greatly appreciate you. I am your host, Josh Ritter. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Joshua Ritter ESQ. And if you want to hear my thoughts and coverage on even more true crime cases, you can also check out my brand new YouTube channel, Courtroom Confidential. And of course, you can find all of our sidebar episodes wherever you get your podcasts. And we want to hear from you. If you've got questions or comments you would like us to address, tweet us your questions with the hashtag TCN Sidebar. And thank you for joining us at the True Crime News Sidebar.